definitely a busy Saturday. I'm so excited to be here with all of you talking about probably my favorite ed tech subject that there is, unplugged preschool coding. And before I jump in with the uh, official content, I also wanted to thank our sponsors, the Augustine Educational Foundation and Sacred Hearts Academy. Thank you so much for making it possible to put on this amazing free ed tech conference. And just a little reminder, don't forget to take the survey that's available online at iteach808.com for your chance to win a Target gift card. And there's also all sorts of other important and great resources and available um, information available on the website. I'll try to remind you guys again at the end of the session. But let me introduce myself. My name is Amanda Sullivan. I'm from Kaneohe, Hawaii, um, and I live here on Oahu. I was born and bred here, but then spent pretty much all of my adolescence and adulthood around the mainland, the East Coast, mainly in Boston, and recently moved back here uh, around two, two and a half years ago. And it's just so exciting to be back here where I'm from, integrating back into the educational community and the ed tech community. A lot of the work that I do is online and virtual. I teach for the Early Childhood Technology Graduate Certificate Program at Tufts University and the Educational Technology Program at University of Phoenix. But mainly in my main work as a consultant, I take on projects related to everything at the intersection of technology, early childhood development, learning, and STEM in general. So, and my favorite favorite uh, age range to work with is preschool. I'm a mom to a preschooler right now. And so this is really something I'm passionate about, not just in my professional work, but in my personal work as well as a mom. And so if anyone wants to stay connected, feel free to connect with me on Twitter or Instagram, or I'll share my email in the chat later on just to give you an opportunity if you ever want to talk about any of the things that we're going to discuss in this training today, or you want to bring brainstorm something about early learning and coding. Um, I'm around and I'm available. So how about you? I'd love to know more about you. I will try to look at chats as they pop up, but I will definitely, after I'm done screen sharing, scroll through the chat and see the questions you have and some notes about you, your background. I'm really curious what brought you to this particular workshop. Are you interested in unplugged approaches? Are you a preschool kindergarten teacher? What um, excited you about learning about unplugged preschool coding today? So feel free to share, feel free to chat the whole time. And I will, if I can't look at things in real time, I'll be looking at all of them at the end and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A and discussion as well. So here is sort of my plan for the 45 minutes. We will look at what exactly is unplugged coding. There are some actually different definitions of what that is and what that looks like. I'll talk about why it's important to even be doing coding in preschool when there's so many other things going on and so many things that we're all focusing on. What is the purpose of introducing coding so early? So I will get into that. And then we will, for the most part, be getting into the how of it. How do we teach unplugged coding? Do we? I'll share with you some of my favorite games and activities that you can do. And I'll also be showing you some books and some screen-free coding and robotics interfaces that can be used to facilitate unplugged coding learning without any computers, tablets, or screen time. I'll have some resources available for you, and we will hopefully have some time for Q&A as well. So hopefully that sounds good. That sounds like what you signed up for today. So, oops, let's get to our next slide. We're gonna be talking about what is unplugged coding, but just in case we don't have a common baseline of what coding is, I thought maybe we should start with that. So code is the language of computers and technologies. We use coding or computer programming to give instructions to our computers and technologies to tell them what to do. And if you're talking to a preschooler or a kindergartner, this is actually about how I explain it. I, I let them know that a program is a list of instructions telling our computers what to do and that computers can only do exactly what we tell them to do. So order is really important. 
important and specificity. Being really specific with the instructions we're giving is also really, really important when we're doing coding. So some of you who um, have a background in computer science or you know, work in technology with older grades might know that there are some nuances and differences between coding versus programming versus other things. But at the preschool level, especially, we can kind of use these terms interchangeably. They are used fairly interchangeably when we're talking about coding and programming um, in the early years. We're really just focusing on honing in this idea that we're giving instructions, telling our technology what to do. Something else that's important to reinforce, especially at that early childhood level, is that there are lots of different programming languages out there, not just the one you might be learning in your classroom or through whatever tool you're using. And we can liken this to how there are lots of different human languages. We might speak different languages at home with different members of our family. So that really helps kids kind of grasp the bigger picture of programming languages and coding in general. It's likening it to languages that they may speak and understand. And so that really helps link it to literacy and other uh, domains that they might be exploring. And then the last piece that's really important to remember and to hone in, especially at the preschool level, is that almost everything we use every day basically runs on code. Things in our smartphones, our websites, apps, games, whatever tools that are digital around their house are made possible because of coding. And so the other, the reason why this is kind of important to reinforce is to give young children this concept of why are we learning about this? Why does it matter? It's, it's teaching them how these devices that they use every day, how they work and that they don't work by magic. If there's one thing that we hope that we can get across to our young preschool and kindergarten students, it's that these things don't work by magic. They work by science, they work by technology and coding is one way that helps support these devices working the way they do. So now we talked about what is coding and how might we talk about what coding is to our young preschool audience. What about unplugged coding? So there's actually a few different ways that people define and approach it. So I kind of want to walk through that with you before we get into the activities that I'll be covering. So unplugged coding is teaching all these big coding concepts and ideas through the use of games or activities that are done offline without a computer, without a tablet, without any um, screen-based interface. One of the hallmarks of unplugged coding is using like arts and crafts, using tangible objects like paper, markers. There's a classic unplugged coding activity that involves using beads to create necklaces and bracelets out of binary code. So these are the types of things that you would do um, in an unplugged approach. At the preschool level, preschool and kindergarten level, I really like to focus on physical play, using physical games with our bodies, dances, things like that to engage in certain coding and computer science concepts. So that's kind of the agreed upon approach, what people mean when they say unplugged coding or unplugged computer science. Now, some people would say that's it. That unplugged coding and computer science can't include any technology at all. While other people will say that using screen-free technologies also embody the unplugged spirit and the unplugged approach. So I will be kind of showing you both so you can decide. I'll be starting with showing you some completely screen-free, unplugged, low-cost games and activities that you can do, as well as I want to introduce you to a few technologies and kits that you can use that are appropriate at the preschool level that I consider to be unplugged because there is no screen time, computer or tablet use. And you'll, you'll see what I mean when I start to introduce those. No matter what game or approach you're doing, this unplugged coding approach is just a really great introduction for our youngest learners at the preschool level because it's hands-on, it can be fun, it can be silly, messy, and collaborative. All of the things that we hope to see in a preschool classroom can be done through this unplugged coding approach. 
So why should we be doing this in preschool? I did promise to touch on that in my introduction. Why are we doing this when there's so many things that needs to be happening in preschool, pre-K, kindergarten? We are teaching foundational literacy. We're teaching foundational math skills. Why are we trying to throw something else in there? Well, I'll share some research on why uh, it is important to begin teaching at the preschool level. But as an educator and a parent, I wanna share my own personal response, which is that it's just a really, really good time. Any of you who work with young children here today are probably used to the fact that they're asking a lot of why questions in preschool. They're asking why and how, and they're trying to understand how the world around them works. This is the perfect time to start teaching them about coding, about engineering, about the sciences, because they're already naturally curious and they, they want to know how things work the way they do and why they work the way they do. They're sponges. And so it's the perfect time to begin introducing these concepts while they're asking these questions rather than later on when you're kind of like forcing it in. Um, it's better to start teaching it when they're naturally curious. And that really just makes it so much fun and so much more engaging for all of you. But there's a lot of research that shows that there are long-term benefits to early exposure. So aside from it being just a really good and appropriate time, we know that learning coding through tangible interfaces and robotics kits can foster mathematical skills, language skills, and visual memory. It can engage children in collaboration and teamwork and communication and all of those positive social emotional skills that we want kids working on in early childhood education. And my own work and my own research focuses on the importance that of early childhood as a critical period in development to reach girls and other groups who are historically underrepresented in STEM fields, to pique their interests early on before they're so ingrained with cultural stereotypes and all sorts of other influences about who is good at coding, who is who belongs in STEM fields. It's really important from an equity perspective to be reaching all all kids, regardless of their backgrounds, regardless of their gender identity, early on with these positive, you know, identity forming experiences with STEM and with coding from an early age. And we, you know, we can't really control what's happening in the culture that kids are growing up in, what's happening at home. But what we can control is what we expose them to in the classroom and ensuring that all kids get this, you know, equal chance to excel and fall in love with STEM is really, really important. So aside from all of that, we're teaching through coding, whether it be an unplugged approach or a plugged approach, really important technical skills as well as non-technical skills that are you know, applicable across content domains. So we're, one of the hallmarks of coding is that kids are engaging in problem solving, or you might've heard that referred to as debugging in coding, which is where you find out why something in your code isn't working the way it is, and you try to figure it out and make changes iteratively until you get it to work the right way. This is really problem solving. And this is something that is important across academic domains and is an important life skill. Kids are also engaging in communication, creativity, and self-expression. And I can't, you know, reinforce this enough. A lot of times when we think of coding, computer science, STEM in general, we're not thinking of creativity, of self-expression, of communication. But really that can and should be ingrained in coding education. As I mentioned, coding is a language. It's another language. So it's another means for kids to express themselves, to put their personality in, and to let their creativity shine through. And at the preschool level, I, I usually find a lot of kids who struggle with communication and self-expression or maybe are, aren't as verbal as their peers, sometimes coding, just having this other interface, this other means to communicate and share can be really powerful. And it can be an outlet for these kids that maybe are struggling to communicate and express through other modalities. So it's really always important at the early childhood level and beyond to give kids multiple tools for expression. And I think we should be sure that we're thinking of coding as one of these tools as well. 
And then sequencing is at its heart in coding. You know, we have, as I mentioned, specificity is key. You have to give your instructions in a very specific order. And so order really matters when we're coding. And this is an important skill called sequencing, which is an important pre-math and pre-literacy skills. It's understanding that order matters and there's a logical sequence to events. And some of the research that I did a while back was really exciting because I saw that preschool and kindergarten kids who engaged in a coding and robotics curriculum, their ability to sequence picture stories significantly increased after participating in that curriculum. And what that told me, what was so exciting about that is that the sequencing skills that kids are learning through coding are transferable outside of coding, that it's just increasing their sequencing skills in general. It's helping them to sequence stories and to sequence with counting and math and to have just general logic skills. And that's really exciting because a lot of the time we're trying to think about how can we squeeze in technology? How can we squeeze in coding when we're doing so much? And it's really helpful when research shows us you're not squeezing in something extra. You're just reinforcing through another tool the skills that will set kids up for success in literacy, in math, in science, and across all of the subject areas that you're teaching. And as I mentioned, collaboration and teamwork, especially I think with unplugged approaches, we see this a lot more. You know, when kids are working with technology, with digital technologies, we are, you know, rightfully very focused on one to one. We want one device per child. And this makes sense, right? You don't learn how to write by sharing a pencil. We want kids to have their own devices. And so that has its own place. But when we're looking at unplugged approaches, you know, you're not focused on every kid sitting quietly staring at a screen. You're doing these games, you're sharing these tangible objects and tools. And so what you see is a lot more of a collaborative, playful, spirited, environment, often messy, often chaotic. Um, and that's really is what we want to see at the preschool level. And we're working so hard when kids are in preschool to teach about turn taking, about sharing, about how to effectively work together. And unplugged coding can really help facilitate all of these amazing skills that we want kids to get before they're entering their formal K-12 education. So a lot of those are benefits to coding in general. Some of the specific benefits to the unplugged approach is that it can be low cost or free to initiate. So I will be sharing with you some of my favorite because completely free physical games that I like to do, but I'll also be showing you a few resources that might help facilitate um, those games if you're looking for like visual aids or a picture book to go along with it. Um, and so that is one of the big benefits. Of course, I will show you a few robotics kits and things that don't fall into that category of low cost or free, but really one of the hallmarks of the unplugged approach and something that you'll all be able to do after this 45 minutes with me is get out there and do something right away for free that reinforces coding and computational thinking with your young children. Uh, and, you know, the other hallmark, of course, is that there's no screen time, which means it's really more developmentally appropriate for our young learners. We know that kids, you know, at this tender, you know, two, three, four, five, six years of age shouldn't be getting uh, so much exposure to screen time. So this is really great that we can reinforce some of these skills without any screen time. It's playful and physical, and it can be a really approachable entry point for kids who maybe don't think of themselves as techie or don't really aren't drawn to science, but they love arts and crafts or they love sports. It allows us to reach different kids. And that's what we should be doing with STEM, especially thinking about you know, this equity perspective that I mentioned earlier, we shouldn't be trying to reach the same kids in the same way. We should be trying to find new ways to reach kids and to give them positive experiences in the sciences. And we should be finding ways to reach more grown-ups and more teachers. So I find that unplugged approaches can be really, you know, approachable and not so scary for teachers too. Teachers who might be worried about integrating a new technology or don't feel like they have the skills to do a new program on the computer can feel a little bit less apprehensive when it's just 
can be seen as a game or something they'll do during circle time. It can be a really great first step um, for everyone. So without further ado, let's get into some of these games that you can do to reinforce these skills. So these are a few of my favorite physical games that you can do with kids. So the first, they're all actually kind of iterations and variations of each other, and you can play around with them and be creative and make them your own. And all of these games also can work well as an unplugged component of maybe a plugged language that you're using. So some of you might be familiar with things like Scratch Junior, for example. All of these games are things you can do even if you're using like an, a screen-based program or coding language, but you want to integrate more unplugged play, you can use these unplugged games to reinforce the skills that you're learning through these app-based languages as well. So my favorite one is Coder Says. It's kind of an iteration of Simon Says. You might have heard this game called a few different things. You might have heard it called Kid Bots. You might have heard it called Programmer Says. But essentially at the heart of this game, there's one person who is the, the coder or the programmer giving instructions to all the other people who are pretending to be robots. And they can only follow those instructions if they're given in a clear, specific way. Um, you might integrate some syntax rules in this game to make it more challenging. So perhaps they will only start if you, the coder gives them a start command and an end command, and it has to be you know, following some of those specific rules. Or if you're working with really young kids and it's the first time you're doing it, it might be just much more similar to Simon Says. So the coder is going to say, stand up, coder says sit down, and kids will act them out. And you can progressively make this game more challenging as you get used to it. And it's a really fun physical game. If you are learning a, an, another programming language, you can use sort of visual aids from that programming language to play this game. Another version that I like is program your teacher or program your friend. This can be something you do as a whole class in, in a circle activity, or if your kids are familiar with it, they can break off and do this in, as a pairs activity. So in this game, you would program another person to do something. So you might have them navigate from point A, the chair, to point B, the garbage can across the classroom, or you might be programming them to do a dance like the hokey pokey or the cha-cha slide. Whatever it is, you wanna have them do something, you have a specific end goal in mind and you have to be very specific with giving your instructions to them if they're gonna act it out the correct way. And if not, if it doesn't work out, if you were trying to program them to do the hokey pokey, but it turns out to be something completely different, then you have to use a really important problem solving skill called debugging and try to figure out what, what, what went wrong with how you gave those instructions. Another like really classic, classic unplugged activity that people do around um, this concept is making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. This is actually something a lot of preschool and kindergarten classes do even without the lens on coding, but trying to give someone very, very specific instructions to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is actually really, really hard. And it exercises some of that, those same coding skills that you need to do when you're giving really, really specific instructions to your computer um, or your device later on. So this is a fun introduction to those concepts. And then another fun one is coding scavenger hunt. You might have little prizes and trinkets hidden across the classroom or outside and through giving kids coding instructions. In this case, I think it works better if you have something visual like arrows or, or symbolic language that you're looking at. And by following those instructions really specifically, then they might uncover these things that are hidden across the classroom. And as kids get better and more skilled at doing this, they can create their own language of instructions and you know, create a scavenger hunt for their friends or for their teacher as well. So all three of these games are things you could do without buying anything. You could just do them today and start reinforcing some really important coding skills to your preschoolers. But there are some really cool visual aids that are still low cost that can help you facilitate this. So Little Coder, some of you might've seen, it's, it's kind of small. It's like the, a little bit around the size of like a deck of cards. And it comes with all of these like directional arrows. 
And when we're working with preschoolers, whether you make these yourself or you buy something, I do think it is really useful to have visual cues when you're playing some of these games like Coder Says or Program Your Teacher. Just remembering that their working memory um, isn't holding that many things at once in preschool. So having something visual to lay out the sequence for whether they're programming their teacher by laying out these cards or they're programming a friend or you're giving them those scavenger hunt instructions, having the visual cue can be really helpful. And these cards come with instructions of like different games you can play, but you can also just use them in a visual, as a visual aid, if you will. And they're around 20 or $25 online. So still, I would say in that low cost category. I love to use these because they're big. They're like eight and a half by 11 cardstock and you can easily photocopy them. A little bit higher price point, $42, I believe, but really big and colorful and useful. These accompany the robotics kit that one of the robotics kits that I'll show you later on, the Kibo robotics kit. And so these cards are functional, actually. If you have that robot, you can scan these cards and, and it will work. But you can also just use them completely as a visual aid. And I wanted to show this picture because um, the picture on the side that you see on the blue mats uh, was when I was doing a, an unplugged coding activity with preschoolers recently um, during Hour of Code. And they were putting together um, a string of code to have their parents act out. And what, you, what you'll see here, if you can kind of tilt yourself sideways for this picture, is that they put some instructions before the begin block and they put some instructions after the end block to try to trick their parents. Um, and so having something with syntax rules, like I mentioned, where if you, if you teach them that every code has to start with a begin and has to start with an end, then they can be playful with it during these games and try to put things after the end block or before the begin block. And then the people acting out the code need to really think carefully that they're only gonna act out what is in between the begin and the end. And so I, I like having a language or visual language that does have some rules because then it's just a little bit more preparation um, for coding and sequencing and, and debugging as well. So I, I do love these cards that you can use. Similarly, there's also board games that work great for like a center activity, things like that. Robot Turtles is one that you might've heard of. It's a board game where uh, two to four players can play. They're trying to navigate their turtles to get to the jewel. And um, you use these directional arrows and cards. And so part of my purpose in showing you all of these is you could totally make your own visual aids and cards to do any of this. Or it might be interesting to think about supplementing things that you have in your classroom with some of these low cost uh, tools. But I do love Robot Turtles because you can make the playing board really, really simple or really, really difficult. Um, you can choose what types of cards to integrate from very basic coding cards to function cards, things that are a little bit more complicated. And so it really is a game that you could kind of build on through, through like a center. It does require some adult scaffolding, especially in the beginning until kids get the hang of it. Um, but once they do, you can kind of add on and make it more and more um, complex as kids move on through um, the skills that are introduced. It's also a great thing to recommend to parents if they're looking for something that they want to do at home. Um, this is a great board game that you can recommend. It's, a, I believe, around in the $25 price point. And lastly, it can be as simple as introducing books. Um, some of you might have heard of Ruth Spiro because she writes a lot of these baby loves, you know, science type of books like gravity, uh, you know, things, all sorts of different science concepts in a really, really, really toddler friendly uh, digestible way. So especially if you're working, I know preschool can mean anything from age two to age five, especially if you're working with that like two to three-year-old age range. I love um, this book, Baby Loves Coding, because it really walks through what is code, what is a sequence. It lays out, you know, some visual illustrations that are really helpful. And so just even starting with a picture book and starting those discussions, I think can really set you up to be doing this unplugged work that we're all trying to do.
But like I mentioned, there are some robotics tools that you might be interested in checking out. So I wanted to show you a few different um, unplugged robots that don't require any screen time. And uh, my colleague, Amanda Strahacker, is giving a presentation for I Teach 808 right now that gets into robotics that you can check out the recording later on, as well as I did a presentation all on robotics last year for I Teach 808, and that recording is still up. So I'm going to go through this part kind of quickly, but I just wanted to show it to you, and if you have any questions, we can go through it in more detail in the Q&A. But Codapillar is one that you might have heard of that is great for this preschool audience. There's actually two versions. There's one where you are connecting the segment yourself, um, the segments yourself. Each segment of the robot has a different direction and that's the code that tells the robot what to do. And then there's also another version that's I think great for like younger preschoolers where the segments are already connected and you're just twisting the top to give the instructions that you want to give it. There's just a little bit less fine motor control that's required when you're using that version. And one of my favorite activities that I like to do with Codapillar is tying into literacy and tying into a book like The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle and integrating an arts and crafts component, um, a problem solving component. There's some counting where you're remembering what foods the caterpillar ate, how many of them it ate. And then of course the programming component, I like to have kids then program their robot to go from you know, the beginning of the story where it eats one you know, apple, I think it is, all the way to the end until it becomes a butterfly and getting kind of creative with how you illustrate the robot eating the food just through what action you have it do. So this is one of my favorite little like activities tying into literacy and the arts. This is a great way to engage preschoolers. Another robot, Codapillar is made by Fisher Price. This is another Fisher Price robot. Well, the Fisher Price robots are um, like the under $80 price point. This is great for ages three to six. I think it, this one's better for more of a center activity. It's a little bit harder to share, um, but the, there's directional keys on the robot's head and that's how you program the robot to move and do different actions. And there's different modes with this robot, which is really interesting. So you can do a free coding mode where you can just tell it to do whatever you want it to do, or you can do a challenge mode and it can challenge you to do things like create um, a code with exactly three instructions. And so the kids have to give exactly three instructions, things like that. And this can be a really fun kind of center activity that is, as I mentioned with robot turtles with the board game, it requires a little bit of adult facilitation and making sure kids know all the rules. Kinderbot really doesn't require that much of that because it talks and gives these instructions kids can kind of figure it out and play with it as soon as you open it and put batteries in, they can kind of um, get it to do things that they want it to do. And one activity that I like doing with Kinderbot um, is having kids try to program different shapes. You can actually use any of these activities with any of the robots, but I'm just giving you some examples of ways that I've used it. Kinderbot actually comes with this secret code book and it gives you different shortened codes to have your robot draw out these different shapes. And so this can really link to anything you're doing with like geometry and learning about shapes and what they're called and how many sides they have, integrating that with some coding. Bebot is another one that you might have heard of. It's programmed in a very similar way with directional keys on top of the robot. And something that I love about Bebot and why a lot of preschool and early elementary teachers love Bebot is that it's really easy to integrate with subject matters because they sell these different mats for the robot. And these mats allow you to integrate with literacy, community studies, math, to create your own games. You can really do anything. And you know, you could create your own mats for any of the robots that I've introduced, but I will say that Bebot really makes nice 90 degree turns and really does work well on these grids as compared to some of the other robots that I've showed you. And lastly, I wanted to quickly introduce you to Kibo, which is the robot that I worked on at Tufts University throughout my PhD. So I'm a little biased. I do love Kibo. It is the highest price point. So in that respect, I do feel like it moves a little bit away from the spirit of low cost unplugged coding. That being said, 
It is completely screen free and allows you to do all sorts of amazing and exciting things starting at the preschool level. So I really wanted to show this to you as well. It's based on over 15 years of academic research at Tufts. It's physical, not virtual. And it really meets the needs of four to seven year olds, a little bit younger, a little bit older as well. So this is kind of giving you a glimpse of how we developed it from research prototype to commercial product. And it's now available online through Kinder Lab Robotics or Amazon and other retailers. But how it works is that you assemble your Kibo robot with motors, wheels, lights, and more. And so what's a little bit different about Kibo than some of these other early childhood robots that I showed you is that there's a building and engineering component as well. And then you program its actions. It's completely screen free using a language of interlocking wooden blocks. There are some simple rules like what I showed you. You have to start with the begin and end with an end. And then there's also more complicated coding concepts you can explore like repeat loops, sensors, conditional statements, and more. At the preschool level, I love to just integrate it through dance, music, song, physical stuff. As you know, I like to do that um, from some of the earlier activities that I showed you. You can do this activity of programming the Hokey Pokey without a robot. You can create your own language with arrows and symbols and syntax rules and have kids work to program themselves to dance out the Hokey Pokey. But this is how we would use it with something like Kibo and how kids might dance and sing along with it. So let me show you this little clip. You put your robot in, you put your robot out, you put your robot in, and you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. So regardless of whether you're using a robotics kit or just doing sort of the other more simpler unplugged activities, I do love to see kids up, dancing, physical, and trying things out. So that's kind of a glimpse of what this might look like in the classroom. Oops, you put your robe. Sorry. <laughs> and you can really integrate Kibo and any of the robots across different curricular activities, thinking about using it as a new means to learn uh, content that you're exploring as opposed to something totally extra and separate. Something that I hear a lot is when should you move from this unplugged approach that I'm talking about to a plugged approach. There's really no right answer, but whenever kids are ready, you can move on to something like Scratch Junior. And it will also depend on whether you have the resources, the technology and whatnot. There's other presentations on Scratch Junior, so I'm not gonna get into that. But if you do check out these Scratch Junior coding cards, you can see that there are unplugged activities that you can do as well. And and so always remembering that just because you're moving on to a screen-based technology, when you're working with young children through second and third grade, you always also want to think about supplementing and integrating unplugged, screen-free, collaborative things as well. So here are some tips and resources, and then I want to move into the Q&A, but just remembering to try everything yourself, celebrating your mistakes remembering to value open-ended play and experiences. And ultimately what we want is for kids to move from learning just to code, but using code to learn about other subjects and books and things that they're exploring. You can check out this amazing website, csunplugged.org for a whole range of unplugged resources. You can find all sorts of different topics, um, curriculum, all sorts of things that you can do. I will say that most of the activities that they have start at around age five, but that being said, I found them easy to kind of adapt when I've wanted to use them with a preschool audience. And you can see they even show you how you can integrate to different curriculum and what prerequisites you'd have to do and all of that. If you want any more resources, these are some of my favorite books. And I did give the link to my slides to um, the ITJ08 website. So you can go back and get all of these slides later on because I also have links to everything that I mentioned so that you can find them more easily if you wanna learn more. But now, um, since we're almost, I think we have about five more minutes, it's around 1140 and this is supposed to go until 1145. I wanted to make sure um, I took some time to answer any questions or comments um, that you might have. And this is my email and my website if you want to keep in touch about anything after the facts.
I'm gonna, I'll take a look at the chat, but anyone um, is welcome to, to jump in here. Oh, hello again, everyone. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. It was really informative. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and do a quick um, ending thing and then we can get to any questions that you have for Perfect. Amanda. Um, but thank you again, Amanda, and for everyone's participation today. We hope that you found this session helpful and make some made some valuable connections. Um, we do have a survey, like Amanda mentioned earlier. Um, it's going to be at the I Teach 808 website, but it's also going to be sent to the email address that you registered with. So you can go ahead and do that. Um, but also try to check your spam folder for any emails from the I Teach 808 Hawaii at gmail.com because it might end up there. And then you will be entered to win one of 20. $5 Target gift cards if you complete it by February 4th. Um, but again, thank you for being here today. And um, that was the last session of the day. We do have more on Wednesday, so feel free to check those out as well if you did sign up and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.